I am being followed. In the twilight, it is a shadow unseen. Standing in ankle-deep green clover, I look behind me to no avail. There is no one visible on the path, but the shadow pursues me. I feel the weight of his eyes on my back. He seems to know my mind, moving as I move. He flees from sight when I venture a look. Pink sky eastward, but no sun will brighten this day. Following the old path to the top of the rise, I gazed at the shadowed land before me, rolling hills to the tree line, a thick fog, the edge of southern dimwood. The path behind me still, I lowered my pack to the ground. First to be fastened to my oxhide belt were three long bottles of water along my rear a silver flask of blood fruit cider along my left flank. I will need the strength. Hooked beside it, I placed my potion of feral sight to help me see better in the dark. On my left thigh, I attached my staunch powder, clover and cloth. A knife of hardened copper was strapped to my right. Straps wrapped and buckled, I hung my three throwing axes from the front of my baldric and fit all three javelins in the loop across my back. Hefting the comfortable weight of my war hammer, in my left hand, I lifted the zebra hide wrapping out of the emptied pack. Slowly, I removed the oiled cloth and withdrew the ancient scabbard. The early morning sun illuminated the beautiful mirror-like longsword, the inscription, Svanak Ordu Malkrul, cast in shadow. My grandfather had been the steward of an elderly knight who had himself the nephew of a venerable wizard who had inherited this relic blade. Grandpa said the words meant dragon of the order of Omalakrul. The sword was forged in the halls of ancient Talandathar. And it is said that the blade obeys more the mind of its wielder than his muscle. I stood back on the road and sheathed the weapon, leaving the pack on the dirt. The sky lightened as I walked onward, hammer in hand. Traversing the path, my mind wandered. Two moons ago, we disbanded upon returning to North Shanadar, each man to his own spread. While away... Patrolling the foothills of Devilspire Mountains, I lost my family. I returned to a half-eaten wife. My two little ones, they were gone. On that day, I died. I am as the undead, a vacant husk having lost his soul. The gods mean nothing to me. I will sacrifice nor serve them no longer. If given the chance, I will see if this sword can gut a god. My wife possessed more virtue than any goddess. My children were without fault. Gone. Not eaten and killed. This was the work of Dendrax. As I was burying my wife, the other men gathered at my farm. The Dendrax had been busy. Kicking a stone, I stared at the dark line of green that was ancient Dimwood. I would not be going quite that far. Still looking, I drank deeply, emptying a whole long bottle before dropping it. I am Commander Grigrick Dubrard. On this very day, I will die. When the sun was hot and halfway to its height, at salutation as we call it, I found the first body. Cammon's lifeless eyes stared at the sky. Torn cloak, bloodied face, stripped of weapons, he too had found his wife dead. Heavy boar tracks were all about. The Ungari, a pig people, foul, violent, stupid. Cammon and the others had not waited for me. Before moving on to the next rise, I glanced back toward my stalker. He is good. A few lone trees, low bush patches, rocks, somewhere unseen, I felt him watching me. I know he is a killer, 
trained in ways unknown to me. Turning back toward my goal, I strode forward. The Dendrax had come by night. Twelve children taken. Five families destroyed. Five farms rendered meaningless. The gods do not care. We spend our lives thanking gods for all the good that randomly happens, then blame ourselves when their favor is withheld. Piss on the gods. I sold my farm laden with unharvested carrots, radishes, potatoes, onions, and turnips. This year was my rotation for the root crop. Also sold my new load wagon, provender, silo, and well. All of my dairy stock means nothing. An empty house, only wind through its windows. The silence within was a reminder of what once was there to fill it. My chickens sold quickly. I sold my mule and war horse. My iron and copper spades, forks and plow brought me a half silver by themselves. A life of gains by fight and fortune, reduced to coins and gems. My pouch full of silver discs, two gold ingots, a triangular emerald wedge, and two opals. A good bounty, the measure of a man in metal and mineral. Suddenly a bulk snorted, rushing me and I moved. The Ungari took my warhammer in his chest. It was like hitting a tree. I smacked away the large bone nose horn of the scaly animal the Borman rode upon. As the beast turned its thick body around for another charge, I saw the pit hidden by shrub they had emerged from. I looked about. It happened so fast, seemingly out of nowhere. Now I knew why. A single Ungari scout on a, on a Vorok. That great horn and massive hooves behind so much weight would end a man quick. The pig man wheezed, clutching his chest. I had hit him hard as he charged. I probably broke his breather. My men called it worm feeder, this hammer of mine. It was good for knocking skulls. Yellowed, hateful eyes glared at me as he pulled the reins and turned the creature around. It galloped in the direction I was going. I let him go, watching him disappear over the next rise. To Stannis and Imara, my friends and neighbors, I gave my spice, the root cellar stock in my wardrobes. Seeing my wife's things, Imara burst into tears. I told her to use the clothes and jewelry to honor her memory. Stannis stood proud. He held my axe. I was his company captain when we bled the lizard folk back to their dens. In those days, I used that axe. We had never feared the Dendrax. Our farms had never been touched. The hideous things looked like walking trees a head taller than men, tough as oak, mindless, hungry flesh eaters. I had heard the stories we grew up with them, how the witch of Dimwood stole children in their sleep. But now they were here and real, far from the comfortable campfires where little ones learn about them. They had taken my boys. I had to know more, so I told the men to wait. I went to see the gnome. When I found him at Burroughs Crossing, what he had told me only sealed my fate. I don't remember the taste of the ale as he spoke. It is said that she came to Dimwood in the War of the Black Tides, 24 centuries before the Cataclysm. From out of the deep with the minions she had come, they made war against men at Talandathar. The gnome's words in the lamplight stirred old memories, echoes of grandfather's stories. Talandathar was our origin, the metropolis of men. For this reason, the other races called us sons of Dithari. As the ground shook, I felt them before they crested the hill and charged me. Four bull Voroks carrying Ungari with maces and a morning star with a spiked chain. Stupid pigmen, to charge downhill in pairs. Two hulks stampeded roaring, horns seeking to impale. The weight of the four beasts moved the hill. Strangely, as I readied my hammer and sword, the gnome's words passed through my mind. 
It is said she provoked the tyrant to attack Talendathar in the war of Mygok the Titan. I spun and reached my blade gashing open the right flank of one of the monsters, a blink later severing the Ungari rider's right leg below his knee. The beast howled and the leg hit the ground. The rush of air above my head hummed as the knotted iron morning star passed over, its wielder and steed trampling by me. A Vorok hit the ground, laying on its side, squealing, eyes wide, showing white. Bloody guts protruded from the gash I made. Its rider was quietly sitting on the ground, legs severed off, pooling blood. The three others turned downhill and looked at the carnage. Yellow, angry eyes above carved tusks. The words of the gnome haunted me. It is said to be in the Datham archives, in the temple of eternal lore now buried under Talandathar. The records of her doings. The mage lords knew that it was she who induced the Nimbolk dwarves, the Sylphani elves, and the Draconark of Winterfang to attack men. The Ungari dismounted wisely. The Vorok squealed, thrashing about. The Morning Star began circling, promising violence. The other two boarmen were smarter, charging with maces, and I stepped into them. Four fingers separated from an Ungari fist and flew through the air, tumbling with his mace, the tip of my long sword. Crack! My heavy warhammer smashed through his collarbone. The second pig warrior blocked my blade, but then bent over my hammer, red saliva spraying the dust. He froze. I hit the dirt and he took the morning star in the face. As the third Ungari drew back the star for another swing, covered in blood and bone fragments, I hit him in the hip with a hand axe. He pitched sideways and I stood, throwing another axe. It sank into his thigh, but he still swung the chain, growling. My last hand axe, hand axe struck his crotch, and he collapsed. Three Voroks stupidly stared at me. The fourth was quiet, and still completely bled out. These Ungari were done. Fingers gone and collar broken, a pig man whimpered face down in the ground, chewing on dirt mindlessly. The one missing a leg laid on his side as if asleep. Checking myself and gathering my weapons, I ventured another look in the direction I had come. I am not chased. My pursuer is patient, watchful. At times, I can almost feel him following in my footsteps. I move forward, trapped between two deaths. A female fiend and my unseen follower. I left the Ungari to die as they deserved. Perhaps they prayed. A smart one would question why his god did not protect him. As I traversed the path, my mind dwelt back to the gnome. Pulling absently on his braided beard locks in the candlelight, the gnome quietly told me what was the fate of my boys, what the Dendrax need them for. I had vomited. The stories of men knew nothing of this garden. Hollowly, I stared into the flame. The alder witch cannot be killed by a human. She does not sleep. In devouring souls, she sings a terrible song. Tis only time she shuts her eyes. What she was before the cataclysm is not known. But there be whispers among the ancient of fairy kind. The Phalorn that she has been something darker, a greater evil during the shadowed ice. In the deep, she was the last female of her kind. Walking atop another hill, I sheathed the long sword in a flash of reflected sunlight. I surveyed the landscape, sensing something, and then a voice broke the silence. Mortal man, Flee this wretched haunt. The words came as if, as if from a deep well. A face on an old boulder 
Inspecting it closer, I saw spiral designs, large brows, and the hint of a mossy beard. I stared at the face, stunned. What is this? What sorcery makes speech from stones? At my words, the rock faced face moved. Stones? We, oh man, are the watchers. She hath enslaved our kind. We, stones, the large brow bowed slightly. We are the necklace, human. I looked closely at the boulder face and followed its gaze. Another large rock half buried in the dirt. Then further off, another. The other way revealed more stones of this size and antiquity. A long line of ancient boundary stones, each rock covered in spirals and symbols. A son of Dathari. Her necklace guards the neck. Yaldbach. A shiver assailed my spine despite the heat. I knew the name. The neck was the tower of the witch. Come not this way, mortal. Choose another path. Listening, I sheathed the blade and, and leaned my hammer over my shoulder. Will you oppose my passage? Nay, human, but it is folly. I am a slave. By passing the necklace, I am compelled to report. Melancholy etched the rocky face. Looking ahead, I saw the trees. So close now, smaller hills covered with their greenery. Behind me, I studied the path, carefully searching for one who stayed unseen. Then give your report, rock that speaks. Sound loud, your alarm, friend. Tell her that I am Gririk, and that on this day, the neck shall be severed and the necklace set free. Astonished, the round eyes of the rock elemental watched the human pass into her domain, bound to the border of the older witch. It was unable to stop itself from conveying to her what it had heard and seen. Marching down the stony hill, I recalled the gnome mentioning the necklace. It made little sense to me at the time. What is it? I asked the gnome lying between us on the round plank table in the dank cellar under Burroughs Crossing Inn was a shard of blackish iron affixed to a wicker arrow, raven-feathered shaft adorned in unusual glyphs, a piece of a great spear from the world below, used by a dusk giant to kill a dragon. It be minion forged, I do not kin the bowcraft, gnome. Nay, indeed, does not matter. You are human. She cannot be killed by you. Your aura to her is red like a scroll. Carry this arrow, Gririk, and she will know it. I need to know how to find her. The gnome looked at me with curiosity. I made no move to take the arrow. Foul artifact. I did not want to touch it. Over the centuries, many of your people have tried. About 70 years ago, a large group never returned from the neck. A second expedition was cut down at the necklace. Others have tried. How do you know these things? Many have drank their last ale dregs here. He pressed his gold beard collar down, straightening his hair, and raised a half-empty tankard. As he drank deeply, his keen eyes watched my own. I was studying the arrowhead fragment. I should not have showed you this. It'd be stolen. Even now, its owner is hunting for it. A movement startled me out of the past. I looked at an enormous tree stump, waist-high with gigantic roots like spider legs sunken into the soil. The bars of a wooden cage were in a circle. 
an open-air dungeon cell made of a tree, roofed by the rest of the tall tree, a tree hollowed into a prison. Something had moved inside the wooden bars. A sudden burst of obsidian-winged fury erupted from the tree cell as crows protested my approach. Inside the cell was the decomposing body of one of my men. Not one of them had waited. No need to see more. I moved away and studied the trees. It was too quiet. The damned birds were already going back to their meal. Noticing them, I looked back up the hill I had descended. Great boulders, crags, shrubs, scattered trees, thin and small. My search is futile. Tracked unceasingly by a murderous ghost. I know he will not let me see him. But he is there observing me, getting closer, waiting for me to fall. The hairs on my neck tell me that I am watched. When I turn back around, a tree limb hits me in the face. A second later, I hit the ground, landing on my rear, dropping my hammer. Through a blurry haze, I saw a troll-like face gritting wooden teeth and glaring at me through knot holes of dark brown eyes. A small, walking tree like a man, two arms and legs, but covered in bark and twigs. Ivy vines wrapped around its torso and left leg. A dendrac. Its oaken, oaken arms were about to swing again. It never would have struck, uh, snuck upon me had it not been recognized. I dismissed it because it was a tree. It leaned forward and began to twist. An instinct took over. The mirrored Zvanak Ordu Malkrul flashed like a burning razor as I chopped off the extended claw of the wood. As I dropped to the dirt, I severed the abomination's whole left arm at the shoulder, reversed the blade to separate the twig horn to top its head. A quick chop dropped the monster to its knobby knees, a shocked expression now stretching across a wooden childish face. Then did a horrible thing happen. As Ungari and Vorok stampeded toward me out of the deeper woods, the Dendrak shuddered. A whining, all-too-human sound issued from its hideous mouth. My blood froze listening to the weeping of a child. It fell back, writhing in agony, sobbing. I jolted back to Burl's crossing, the braid locks of the gnome reflecting the candlelight. I heard the words of the gnome. The Dendrax keep them alive. The witch has no need of the dead. Possessed of the might of rage rising within my soul, my first javelin sank deeply into the thick neck of a boarman as his horned Vorok rushed by me trampling the dying Dendrak. I jerked out of the way of a second Vorok, slashing its rider's thigh as the hulk careened by. Spinning, I removed the third Vorok's nose horn as a spear winded my face thrown from a group of Ungari afoot. The hornless Vorok buried its inflamed stump into the dirt, pitching its rider into the air as it screeched in pain. The rider flew beyond the reach of my blade. The children are bound helpless, drugged and shook till she is ready. My second javelin thudded into the Ungari chest. He forgot his mission and stumbled off. A spear hurled hastily flew over my head. The lead Ungari raised a heavy battle axe overhead, and I punished him for his stupidity. His pink and purple entrails burst from his navel after the tip of my blade opened his stomach. The battle axe dropped slowly behind his heels. It stood straight up longer than he did. Each child is lowered into a pit, neck deep. Buried in stinking mulch and decayed body parts of forest animals up to their chins. The long sword blade parried a hatchet as my warhammer crunched the arm bones of the pig man that held it. He yelled and dropped quickly to the earth as I hamstrung him. A mace leveraged for my face, so I evaded, spun, and backslashed. The Ungari's head was still rolling when his body fell forward to the ground. Fighting five more boar brutes, through the chaos, I saw the Vorox advance. Planted in her foul garden, the little ones are forced to eat spell-wrought porridge. 
I pulled the long sword out of a body, the Svanak Ordu word somewhere buried in his chest. Mal cruel was the only part I could read. A scimitar aimed at my head, blocked by my hammer. In the press of bodies, I dropped, letting go the sword. Hammer of war crushed the hoof of my enemy. As time seemed to crawl, his howl lingered. I sank my knife in one's groin. When he twisted away, I jabbed the blade in his rear. He screamed like the ghosts in the banshee tales. Snatching my sword, I rolled out of the way as a Vorok bellowed. It be a foul soup. Victims ground into meal mixed with alder bark powder. The rushing Vorok's horn impaled a wounded Ungari, the pig man limp as the beast shook it into him wildly. As the rider fought the reins to gain control, I then slashed them. A spear point angled toward me but wavered, held by an Ungari rider pitched from his mount. My hammer shattered the wood, my blade split apart his tusked face. At the last standing boar man, I looked and he charged. I bashed his head back, snapping his neck with my heavy war hammer. His hooves cleared two palms off the ground as his body fell straight and dead. A boar man sat astride an abandoned Vorok and turned the monster toward me. I only dimly saw the Ungari on the steed, my focus on the words of the gnome. The youth, like plants, they sprout twigs. In shoots, they grow hard as bark. With a roar, the creature lowered his head and charged me. I waited. As it rushed, I hurled the heavy hammer mightily. Leaping away, I heard the fracturing of the animal's bone brow plate. It snapped. The creature slowed to a stop. Its breathing was calm. It stood still. Numb. I walked up to its rider as the Vorok ignored me. With a hand axe now in each hand, I advanced as the Borman yanked his reins, trying to get the Vorok to react. Breathing deeply, the creature did not respond. My first axe sank into the Ungari's lower left back. Tusks vibrated as he screamed. The Vorok did not stir. Breathing. My second axe was used to hack the harness, causing the Ungari to fall over the flank of the creature. He slid off the side, still writhing in pain and unable to fight. The Vorok did not move, but remained standing, watching. With sword in hand, I pinned the pig to the ground. The Dendrax tend their children, for they regard them as their own. The twisted, trampled, dead Dendrak was still. All around it were dead and dying boarmen. I gathered my weapons, emptied a long bottle of water, and strode into the trees. The Vorok was snoring. A dent in its skull clearly resembled my hammer. The sun was good past salutation. Walking through trees up a slight prominence, I studied the greens and browns. Before cresting the rise, a cloud of butterflies drifted off, in and out of the sunbeams. Then I saw the body. Cautious, with the tip of a javelin, I prodded. There was no trap here. There's no mystery either. It was one of the very first Ungari scouts. Before passing the necklace, I had thumped him in the chest with my hammer. This was as far as he had rode. Moments later, still heading toward the crest of this hill of scattered trees, it began misting, a fine drizzle thickening the air. At the top of the hill through large trees, I saw the top of her ancient tower, the neck. Below me stretched out a valley, a swamp. Again, I thought of the gnome. At Sigil's Arch, there is an elf. He might help you. A map, perhaps, he said, using the candle to light his pipe. He has done business with the witch, knows the road, been inside her tower. Why would he help me? Payment, of course. Why else do elves do anything? 
Smoke clouds swirled about the candle flame. Where is he? The gnome paused, shifted. Why, you have not of worth for payment. I do, I have enough. The gnome stared at me. I fought the desire to feel for my heavy coin pouch. He exhaled. Go to the arch. In the market district, go to Phalox Gaming Hall, nigh to the gate of Fairy Court. Inside are my kin. Tell any gnome there that Georod Overboros sends a friend. Then tell them that you seek the moon shadow. Moon shadow? Eh, indeed. But let no elf hear you speak it. You would never return. Now go. I bid you my blessing. Tis all I can spare. I walked the path toward the swamp. The air was heavy with moisture, the aromas of wet earth and old plants. Water dripped through a canopy of green. To my right, my eyes fell upon the decaying hindquarters of a stag, its head and body wrapped in a plant membrane of some flesh-eating weed. As I looked, a nearby tree moved, and I spun, weapons ready. But it was no tree. The dragon-sized python lifted its bulk, entwining higher in a great cypress. I noticed a man-sized lump in its body, and I wondered if it was one of my men. Stretched end to end, I know this land kraken was the length of nine men, maybe more. I left it behind me. It would not serve my ends, dying in the belly of a legless dragon. It was a steep descent. The path went down into swampland. The mist-enshrouded tower jutted above the deep sea of green. I cast my gaze the way I had come, but the land is still. There is seen no one. My shadow is crafty, silent, dangerous, a lurker, a trail of bodies he traverses. I slay and maim and still he comes. I know that he is gaining on me, my victims ignored. The swamp stretched out before me. I inhale its moist, acrid air. The scents and aroma of the living and the dead. Two gulps of the blood fruit juice from my flask brought a burning strength into my gut. It slowly spread to my back, my shoulders, arms and thighs and up my neck. A deep breath had the sensation of immortality course through my being. I'm coming, boys. Papa's on the way. My pain and discomfort fled, gone from a fruit with a few breaths. Unease had melted into a steel resolve. I'm killing that witch. Trudging into the dark, green swamp, the ground quickly leveled out and narrowed into a raised path. Ankle-deep, murky water quickly blackened with unknown depth all around me. As I marched into the swamp, the nearby surfaces of the water on either side exploded with spiders and dancing lizards skimming the top from lily pad to lily pad. A troop of orange and black striped spiders gathered atop an enormous turtle shell, draped in algae. Its occupant long dead and eaten. A sprinting lizard was gulped underwater by a shadow, other lizards clearing away from this new threat. A deep rumbling. Louder, the noise grew. The whole swamp seemed to still. A horn blast, loud, deep, and long. The noise seemed to come from all directions, but faded in only one. The tower. She calls for help? What? Increasing my pace, I knew not what I was, why I was grinning. Hammer in my left grasp and long sword a shimmer in my right. The blood fruit filled me with life. Deeper into the swamp, I passed a small island covered in the biggest toadstools I had ever seen. White with brown veins and bumps. Underneath them in their shadows hung a colony of rip-tailed bats. 
It was passing the giant mushrooms that I found the skimming lizards to be my allies. An area of deep water just off the right embankment of the path was very dark, shadowed. Those spiders, unable to look down, were scattered about. Not one lizard ventured to the spot. I stepped toward the left edge cautiously, relieved to see dancing lizards scatter. But I had no time to ponder what evil lurked beside the path. Old enemies approached ahead. Curved backs, flatheads is what we call them. Spears and sharpened talons, teeth and flint, the lizard folk knew no other weapon. Waddling side to side, these descendants of the Silipenti jungles of the south advanced upon me. I readied worm feeder and my sword. When they neared, spears pointed at me. I counted nine of them, and a tenth wearing a raven-feathered headdress above a toothed necklace with a pouch made of skin. A shaman. In, sm in small engagement, they are little feared. Takes too long for them to utter a spell. But I am alone, and he has protectors. In their rush, I evade the spear to my left and fold the flathead over my hammer blow to its padded stomach. I swing, long sword severing a spear as I spun, pulled the blade tight and whipped it horizontally in my twisting, allowing it to sink sickly into another lizard's warrior's torso. Knee deep in muck, the lizard man, he laid below the surface of the swamp. A spear thrust at my face, but it was easy to evade. I chopped off the warrior's right hand at the wrist and pulled back the pommel of my sword to my hip. It blinked at me stupidly with tooth mouth wide and agape as I thrust the sword into its chest. Quickly, I snatched, tossed a javelin at the shaman, but the weapon suddenly turned in the air as I yanked my sword out of the lizard man. Shit, I really hate spellcasters. The shadow underneath the swamp stirred the water and suddenly a lizard folk warrior was dragged into the deeper murk. I moved to higher ground around a tree with about five or six shoots looking like smaller trees around it. Two more spears closed in on me and I dropped low with a slashing arc of my ancient blade. Two reptilian thighs were chopped in half as a lizard man squawked, splashing into the filth. I backslashed the other bastard and it lowered its spear, blinking, chest flayed open as he lowered into the water. A fifth one leapt up as I parried a spear with my blade. Turning to evade the flying flathead, I burst a burst of stinking muscle with green spots on a pale bluish body erupted from the shadow, catching, catching the flathead in mid-leap dragging the lizard man below the water level with no noise and hardly a splash. The four remaining flathead warriors halted and I chunked one of my hand axes at the fifth, but the shaman was unmoved and my axe splashed into the swamp, muttering murder as it stared, me, stared hard at me. So I charged. The closest lizard man hesitated and I ran him through, the shaman cast his spell. I pulled my long sword out of the bleeding, limp idiot. A reddish tendril of flashing light shot away from the foul marsh shaman, and the words Svanak Ordu Malkrul instantly scintillated in blue light along the edge of my long sword, brighten, brightening with a blue silvery sheen as the crimson magic seemed to get drawn into the steel. Not hesitating, I struck the next flathead and jolted with alarm. I blinked in surprise, seeing that the blade left a trail of icy crystals across the lizardman's midsection as the incandescent enchantment faded. It fell dead, and the others plunged into the swamp opposite the underwater beast. The shaman led their retreat. My peculiar weapon returned to normal. Looking at my, looking at my right, I saw bubbles where the shadow had been. Lizards already reclaiming their lily pads. The anger burned in my bosom. The witch had blown her horn to see me stopped. She thinks to keep my boys. The wailing image of the dendrak blurred my vision. In the still of the humid swamp, I filled my lungs. Hear me, witch! You have taken from the race of Brard! 
stolen what belongs to me. I stamp through the swamp toward the neck. I am Grierick Dubrard, and you shall bathe my blade. I was drooling, half mad, with a thirst for revenge. Out of the darkness ahead they came, a horde. On both sides of the path the lizards fled. Blood fruit potions steeled my nerves, sharpened my focus. Charging toward me were Voroks with Ungari riders, lizardmen, Dendrax, a few very tall behemoths I knew to be Kraxican trolls, swamp tyrants. I saw a wildish-looking human among them. A moan promising violence came from my right. I glanced to see a huge threat moving toward me through the swamp, chest deep in the filth. A moss hump ogre. Boils covered its head, face, and chest. It salivated at the sight of man flesh. Seeing it lumbering my way through, through much seemed to anger me even more, and I inhaled sharply. No more, witch. No more will you hide in your tower. Two necks will be cut apart this day. My mind flashed through a tunnel of another's memory. Children, petrified with fear, dragged down this very path. No more. My hammer met the brow plate of a Vorok, and in the crunch the iron broke bone. Its rider was thrust forward to slide across the sharpness of my blade. Snarling, ungari, and hissing flatheads came to surround me. Club broke against hammer, spear cut asunder by archaic sword. Mortal man, flee this wretched haunt. Words from a miserable rock. She hath enslaved our kind. No more. A lizard man's right arm tumbled overhead. Slowly a Vorok's lifeless bulk slid into the thick swampy morass. Off the path, a spider skittered away. Its rider tried to get off the creature, but lost his head to my reach. A lizard folk warrior thrust Quickly, and I parried, turning his spear into a stick before folding his ribs inward with the thud of my hammer. Another Ungari charged a foot at steed, bleeding in agony, missing a leg. In my dance of death, I don't remember severing it off. The pig man slipped on wet offal, dropping his mace. He jerked his head up to look at me, and I filled his face with hammer. And I laughed. Come here, heathen! I slashed across a Vorak, Vorok's eye, and I reared up, throwing its pigman rider. The creature plunged straight into the mire atop a struggling lizard man, and neither resurfaced. The swamp on the right of me, just off the path, was deep. Join the ranks of her sacrifice! I was giggling as a lizard, war a lizard folk warrior hesitated at my yell, and I repaid him with steel. An Ungari brute with a large bladed glaive swung the old weapon at me. I stepped in to take the blow with the staff instead of the extended blade. It hurt like hell, but not as badly as the foot and a half a long sword I thrust into his stomach. Pigman and glaive fell down. Pray, witch! The hells have unleashed their fury! I am Grierick! I hit a lizard man on the hip with my hammer and I folded him sideways to collapse onto the wet earth. Tactically, it made no sense, but it felt really good hacking his right arm off with my sword as I moved past him. I really did not need the blade elsewhere. Seeing the approach of the Kraxican, I slid the pommel hook of the hammer onto my belt and let go. Only a sharp blade could hurt troll kind. You can beat them till yesterday and run them through with a score of spears and they'll keep at you. Three Kraxican trolls, no doubt from the jungle's waste to the far south. No eyes, just wrinkled faces of scars with two holes of darkness they probably saw out of. Jagged yellow teeth, long gangly arms with talons, vile monsters serving only to kill and eat. No more. I spun low, grappled my blade two-handed, and melted the omalacruel all the way through its knobby shins. The troll fell forward as I sidestepped, kicking a claw away. A second troll reached, and I separated two fingers from the other three and passed the tip of my blade through its elbow, leaving the mangled 
hand to dangle by loose tissue and sinew. Somewhere I heard the voice of my boys. How many orcs have you killed, Papa? I jumped to evade the troll's vicious other arm as I hacked off the head of the crisis control on the ground, still reaching for me. The second time the troll standing before me reached, I took off an entire arm, leaving it only two working feet. The severed arm fell into a mass of little lizards. The furrier said, You fought an axe master at Devilspire, Papa. Is it true? Through a blur of tears, I stepped forward, thrust, twisted to deliver a wicked slash, leaned back and unleashed two hard chops, ending with a reverse spinning slash, and stopped the troll. It sank to its knees, with its throat open, stomach emptying guts over its thighs, and its right knee cut thoroughly. A club thumped against the back of my blade, just above my hand, a powerful grasp on my right calf. Evade, twist, step, pivot, sword raised high, and brought low, fast. Ma said the mountain dwarfs made a statue of you, Papa. Said it stands in the place where a great battle was fought. Can we see it? My powerful downward cleave almost split the third troll's head in twain as the second troll stopped on the path. My calf burned and fiery pain flooded my right thigh. The shin-severed troll's yellow teeth bit into my flesh. I felt it suck out blood. Three times I sank my blade into its ribs before it stopped and fell still. A pig man burped up blood bubbles. Lizards crawl all over a severed hand of one of the lizard folk. Two dendracks were face down, hacked apart. A third had no arms or horns and stared upward, mouth moving mindlessly. Vorok entrails stank and the Ungari dead remained still. Lost in thought, I remembered not how I had killed them. My lungs filled with the dank air. Prepare your spells, hag. Strengthen your staff. You can send nothing alive that I cannot kill. And when I picked Worm Feeder back off my thick belt, and raised it defiantly, my feet left the ground. Too late now to remember the ogre. Powerful fingers like iron tendrils prevented me from letting go of my hammer. Hauled aloft by the immense strength of the moss hump half a half giant, my whole body lifted to arc over its head as it jerked the hammer out of my grasp. The ground of the swamp path hit the length of my whole body with a heart-stopping impact. A snap inside my left arm echoed in my head. Far away, I heard a splash. My warhammer, given to me by the dwarves. It was gone. Knowing my arm was broken, I recalled the words of the gnome. About seventy years ago, a large group never returned from the neck. A second expedition was cut down at the necklace. Others have tried. How do you know these things? Many have drank their last dregs here. The crunch of bones beneath the massive ogre's weight brought me back. Left arm numb with pain, I found my sword still firm in my right hand. I sat up, pulled my last axe, and tossed it as dizziness blurred my vision. Snatching my blade, I looked up at the moss hump ogre. My left arm hung lifelessly, useless. A sharp wind seared my right ear, and I jerked, but my eyes barely followed a shaft as it appeared in the ogre's navel. It bellowed like a herd trapped in a cave, and before my eyes, the ogre stiffened and turned to stone. It was at that moment I began to fear. A second arrow, a finger's breadth over my head, passed into the stomach of the crackling moss hump ogre. More flesh turned to rock. I did, not, I did not turn to look. I knew who it was. The ogre now whimpering as it petrified. A third arrow flew through the swamp air, but where it went I know not. I ran. My coin pouch. A long bottle of water. A couple sips of blood fruit. A copper knife. My long sword. I had lost everything else. As I ran past a large bone midden, the whimpering of the ogre became pitiful wails as more and more of him turned to rock. I could feel my heartbeats in the pain of my arm. 
Multitudes of yellow-green spotted frogs scattered as I approached. A swarm of horseflies buzzed over a carcass, bent over a gigantic lily pad. Spiders and lizards fed. Dark minnows were chased off by a slender shadow. Fear of my pursuer heightened my senses. Again I thought back to the gnome. He had spoke true. I had met the elf. At Sigil's arch in a dim chamber of the Golden Pillar Tabernacle, he told me about his visit to the witch. He had been one of many Silfani accompanying a merchant train that sold its cargo to the older witch. I met his price, and he gave me instruction, advice, a map. Sharing a pitcher of mulberry draught, an elven spirit of Shanadar, I told the quiet elf my plan. And he laughed. Ye human, ye jest, mulberry doth make men mad. In the light of the yellow lamp I did not smile, and his grin faded. Ye be truth? Ye go and do this thing? I inhaled humid swamp and jogged onward through a storm of frolicking fireflies, catching a glimpse of cyclopean stone blocks ahead in the foliage. I was close to her tower. I be truth, damned elf. I be doing this. Behind me all was quiet. The ogre was now stone dead. Moving forward, I stumbled out onto a clearing, a pond surrounded by swamp trees, an island with a walled tower. Yaldabaoth, of some dateless gnomon race. Ivy and creepers covered half of the tower. A lone vulture perched on the broken ruins of a wall. The bird stared unblinkingly. Thoughts of my boys brought, brought here filled me with fury. Do you see through their eyes, witch? Their lids grow heavy when they meet my blade. My voice echoed from many surfaces, but the vulture moved little to none at all. A megalithic cracked pylon of three enormous blocks covered in symbols buried in filth provided the entrance to a raised boulder path leading into the fallen gate and walls. Quickly, Sword leaning on my leg, I withdrew and drank the last of my blood fruit as my left arm throbbed. Discarding the flask, I then drank my feral sight potion and then chased the bitter brew with some water. As I walked across the stones, my eyes began to penetrate the darkness inside the open tower entrance. Three pairs of amber eyes blinked out at me. As I crossed the distance, my eyes began to adjust better, and what I'd mistaken for rocks and bracken was the old skeleton of a Cyprian bog giant, with a slimy, squiddish thing coiled in its rib cage, half submerged along the edge of the island. Some unknown monster. Sword poised, I crossed onto the Isle of the Witch, and before the ruinous walls, I turned abruptly to scan behind. And I saw him under the raised megalithic pylon across the bridge, a hooded shadow. He is statuesque, unmoving, no attempt to conceal himself, this evil close behind me. Murky waters, minnows, and toadstools between us. I know that long after I am dead, he will keep on killing. He has been a breath behind me all of this time. You bow carved like serpent heads with wicker arrow, he makes no move against me. Driven to this end, I turn and plunge into the courtyard. I freeze. To my right, a huge armored shell-backed monster like a turtle, a great green eye blinking at me. Inwardly, I cringed at seeing two were-rats standing like men smoking a share root while appraising me. One exhaled blue smoke, whiskers twitching. Both had bows and spears. They made no move. Ahead, in the entrance, the three shadows dispersed. Alarmed, finding no resistance, the sneer and smoke of the gnome came back to, to my mind. Trust no elf, Greyrick. They seek only to gain. In the beginning, one god lied to another and out popped an elf. This is what is said. The gnome's golden beard collar reflected the dying candle flame. 
He exhaled, exhaled from his pipe and continued. The time of a man is but a whisper in the wind that is an elf's life. Only for silver will, will they serve. The gnome's dislike of elves was like a dwarf's. In truth, there is no love between men and elves either, but nor is there hate. I see differently than the old gnome, his bearded braids weighed heavily with prejudice. But it was not malice that brought Sylphani elves to my farm the night after I buried Ulyssa. They approached me in my grief, wooden tablets in their hands, masterwork engravings of elven prayers. They told me to speak to the tablet and cast it into the fire. As the symbols burned, my wife and boys would hear me. Hours later, I opened my eyes and the elves were gone, the tablets ash. The two were-rats sat atop the shelled monster, making no move to intercept me. Ahead, the blinking eyes all moved to the left inside the dark, unbarred portal. I moved into the tower casemate, arm throbbing, right shoulder sore from overuse, my troll-infected thigh making me wince with pain. In the antechamber of shadow, my surroundings became a low, glowing green. The feral sight potion was working, allowing me to see in the very dim light. Three were-rats stood motionless, holding scimitars, blocking a hall to my left. On my right stood a hulk, the biggest Ungari pigman I had ever seen. Wearing bronze plate armor and holding a bat-winged great axe, the boorish warrior had not two, but four chin tusks. A head taller than I, he made no move. Straight in front of me, the corridor was empty as I ventured forth. A dendrac. An arm-limb gestured toward an open stone door. Glancing about this chamber, I saw a hall continuing forward toward a wide gallery. Three more dendracks stared balefully from a hall they blocked to my left. Through the door, I found the archaic debris of what was once a stairway leading up. A good amount of crude effort had gone into breaking apart the stone steps to make an uneven ramp like a cave road twisting upward. It was eight feet wide and strewn with bones, pottery shards, petrifying hide, fragments and stones. Every step upward loudly announced my approach. Alone on the stair, my mind focused on Georod Overboroughs. The older witch cannot be killed by a human. The gnome was a merchant. His people were meddlers, masters of barter and secret deals. The blood of bandits and black marketeers, unrepentant coin clippers. Only half loyal to dwarves, what animosity they had for elves was equally felt for humans. She does not sleep. Overburls knows much about the witch. About the fate of my boys. The garden. In devouring souls, she sings a terrible song. Tis the only time she shuts her eyes. Bones and pebbles crunching underfoot, my leg burned with fiery venom. The troll bite festered. A boot. Oxhide, recently sewn, sole, sole tracks without rust. Leather tie tassels, well oiled. I know this boot. Belonged to one of my men. For some odd reason, it made me think of the foul arrow I, I, I refused to touch. A piece of a great spear from the world below, used by a dusk giant to kill a dragon. It be minion forged. Climbing the winding stair, I knew that I had been driven to this place by the invisible cords of intrigue and deceit. I am the victim to a plotter, a diabolical scheme designed to leave the planner untouched. It be stolen, even now its owner is hunting for it. At the top of the stair, a thick oak door of wood half turned to stone was open. Standing knee-high tall was a furrowed-faced bantam with pot-belly and beady eyes looking at me warily. He had a long blowpipe strapped across his little back. 
I could see slender needle darts on his baldric sash. I stepped past him and into an old workshop. The weight of the large, irregularly shaped stones of the walls seemed to push down my spirit. Many have drunk their last dregs here. I put the gnome out of my mind. Ancient stone tables with chains supporting skeletons, husks, mummified bodies, and decomposing cadavers of men and women, elves, a few ungari, a dwarf, a couple orcs, and a dozen or so gnomes. Some had had, some had, had their arms and legs removed, their limbless torsos planted in big gray pots filled with putrefying earth. A rack dangled the skeleton of a female, the tiny skeleton of an unborn infant under her brown ribs. In the greenish illumination, I saw movement to my left and my heart froze. Wild human eyes popped open, searching. In the dark, he could not see me. Another one of my men, a bloody mess. His beard had been plucked out. Thanok Greenlay had been planted in a large pot. His arms and legs had been removed for they could not have fit in. His wife and daughter were gone as well. Th Thanok, my voice cracked. Who, who, who? who? Greerick, Thanok whispered, life fading and owlish eyes casting about. Nu, nu, pride of Dubrard, knew you'd come. Thanok trembled uncontrollably, shaking the whole pot. Save the children, save them, my, my little girl, Greerick, Greerick, she's stuffed in a pot, I beg you, I will. My friend shuddered and moaned, then he stilled, erect, Greerick, she closes, she closes her eyes as she, she sings. Thanok nodded over and over again, she sings, she sings. She closes her eyes. Save my girl. Save the children. With the swift arc of my blade, I decapitated my friend. From the oak door, the aged bantam watched me in the dark, saying nothing. Those we cannot carry, we kill. This has long been our compact to save none alive for an enemy. Knife tucked in my belt and long sword ready, I traversed the dim workshop to a keystone arched doorway. Before I entered her chamber, I could feel her presence. In the side, the door at the head of a half circle shaped chamber high in her tower, my eyes fell upon the form of the witch. I was expected. Many thousands of years old, she was, she was not a female I could, I could discern at all. Layers of wrinkled folds of skin, two obsidian dark orbs for eyes, large misshapen head, no neck or shoulders, no breasts, just furrowed skin hanging. She raised an arm and I felt a tug. Zvanak Ordu Malakru flashed in the darkness my blade. My knife was tugged out of my belt. She tried again and again, my sword glowing in protest, defying her. The relic long sword was forged anciently by the mage lords of House Malakrul in Talandathar. I knew not its properties. Again I heard the gnome. From out of the deep, with the minions, she came. They made war against men at Talandathar. The minions were the enemies of the old gods and the traditions of, of the bards. More than this, I know not. A broken, withered body of a man missing a boot lay upon a raised flagstone table. Husks of dehydrated corpses littered the large vault. So strange to stare down at ageless horror and feel no fear. Her black, soulless eyes widened as I advanced, right hand gripping tight an artifact blade. There be whispers among the ancient of fairy kind, the Faelorn, that she had been something darker, a greater evil during the shadowed ice. In a burst of speed, I rushed, sword poised to impale. 
the older witch gestured with her left gnarled hand, and the dead body upon the slab slid off the stone. In midair upon my leap, I was caught by an invisible hand. My sword flashed violently. Slowly, I descended on the table, a godlike weight pushing down on my body. Unable to resist, to struggle, in seconds I found myself laying on the stone, helplessly. Weakening, my fingers loosened, and I heard the sword clank against metal on the floor. In panic, I thought back to the cursed arrow the gnome had tried to give me. Used by a dusk giant to kill a dragon, it be minion forged. She stood over me, stinking, an old stench. Her abyssal eyes lowered as a wide, toothless maw opened in her hideous, wrinkled face. A low, growling moan. The faces of my two boys burned through my mindscape, replaced by my beautiful Ulyssa. I saw again the dendrak I cut down, writhing like a little child in agony. With a mighty heave, I pushed up, and a searing pain coursed through my entire body. The troll venom had spread rapidly, but still I could not move. My broken arm did not hurt me, as did the embers in my chest. She began to hum, and the noise grew deafening. Her rancid breath filled the air heavily, but I could not choke. Her song was anything but a melody, the blast of an old giant's horn with a crack in it, the scream of a soul that knows it is lost. I felt life escape my torn body, energy that has always been felt within now pulled from me, stolen. I grew heavy with an unnatural fatigue. This is for my boys, for sweet Ulyssa. I opened my eyes and looked up at the nefarious murderess as she suddenly choked. Her song halted against a wall of silence. She wheezed, and in the dim light of my dying eyes, I saw the raven feathers, a dark arrow shaft buried in her open mouth. Gurgling gags, a second arrow thudded into her throat, sinking deeply. The fletching was different than the first, much more ancient arrow. A third arrow tore into her right eye. I smiled and grimaced at the same time. The Craxican venom now paralyzed me. She roared, but the hooded shadow in the entry loosed a fourth and fifth arrow rapidly. Folds of nasty flesh older than whole civilizations dried instantly, cracked and petrified. The minion-forged arrow from antiquity in her throat stole her life, and the enchanted arrows of my dark pursuer began turning her flesh to stone. She thrashed wildly, mindless with fury and panic. The older witch would never sing again, never again feed on another soul. She would die with her eyes open. Rock replaced tissue half across her face, around her throat, across her midsection petrified. A roaring whimper escaped her open, arrow-filled mouth when she, when she quieted, stilled, died. She expired with her eyes open, a foul creature from the old world. I stared up at the pale green skin and eyes inside the hood. The Sylphani elf, moon shadow assassin, regarded me silently. My throat was drying, your, your payment, my belt. The guild killer of Sigil's Arch cut away the heavy pouch and rummaged it, eyes narrowed. Tis more than guild fare, Greerick. I can nay, you are not finished. I rasped the sword. Take it too. Its value, it's known. The elf picked up the long sword, puzzled. It rested atop a scattering of other weapons from other time periods when victims were forced to drop their swords. It protected me. No magic could harm me. Then how hath she hurt ye? Not her. Craxican bite. Hearing this, the elf nodded. Mulberry brew? He asked me. A. I brought it. The elf dug through my pockets and found the flask of mulberry brew, taking it out. 
What would ye have of me, Gririk? The elf was sincere. The gnome was so very wrong. The Sultani were a noble race. Even the words of a contract assassin were binding. Before you go, you must find the children. A garden. I died only moments after the Alder Witch. The elf was still by my side when I passed over to the other side. Two days later, the cloaked elf walked into Burroughs Crossing on a blue sky day. The sun was at salutation. He had done as the heroic human had wished. The witch's garden was full of buried children, not all of them human, crazed with fear and discomfort, souls broken, a harvest of monsters in the making. Iron tongs pried open, mouths open, as a stinking soup dripped into their, onto their tongues. Growths, lichens, sprigs protruded from the children's faces and necks. They had already begun to change. Quietly, he had slit their throats. Inside Burl's Crossing Inn, Georod's face lit up seeing the elf. Old friend, sit! The elf saw that the gnome now wore an ornate gold beard collar. Georod, seeing the flask of mulberry draught, pulled out two tankards. A indeed, you drink with taste. I trust all went well. The elf nodded. Good, good, I am avenged. Taxing our trains was offensive enough, but stealing a whole caravan and eating my kin. Infernal witch! Gnomes are not fee feed for the demons. Humans either. Eh? Georod drank deeply as the elf explained. There be none alive like Gririk. Eh, indeed. It is said that Commander Gririk is the mightiest of men. Nay, old friend, there be none like Gririk. Not elves, not dwarves, not gnomes. You forget, he slew an axe master. Gririk was mighty, like the war sloths of Everleaf. Was? Is he dead then? The elf nodded. Hearing this, the gnome thought hard. The Sulfani watched him closely. Well, the gnome cleared his throat and poured himself another drink. That, uh, well, solves another problem. We will make the trade route straight, right through the farmsteads. Save a day to the arch. A sweat broke out across the gnome's brow. A cold seeped into his gut, and suddenly he wanted to lay down. After the moon shadow guild assassin departed for the road, Georod Overburrows remained sitting. He stared in horror, but he was unable to move. The elf had not touched his drink. I hope you guys enjoyed this presentation. This was a short story, a novella out of out of the world of Dagothar. And you can go to the link below and you can get 42, 43, 44 videos uh, uh, that have all been montaged together in the order that you need to see them uh, for the Faelorn saga. Basically, the main characters are the Faelorn. This is an ancient race of fairies that were banished and they find that they have to come back home. And when they come back home, all hell breaks loose because something else is happening. This is the Feynorn Saga, and this is just one of the many short stories that are a part of that world.